We recently launched Liberation Martial Arts Online for trainers, collectives, and individuals that were looking for a program to follow that was chud free or perhaps one that came directly from us. Thanks to MWANKND, Mod, and Chris Barnes for signing up. If you would like to sign up for Liberation Martial Arts Online or just want to increase your financial support of the Southpaw Project, you can find special tiers on our Patreon. If you'd like to listen to all of our shows without any breaks or interruptions, you can find uncut versions of our shows also on Patreon. This is Sam. This is Jason. And this is Fight Study. Coach Jason and I are back with another edition of Fight Study. We're going to look at Calvin Cater versus Josh Emmett, then preview Armand Sarukian versus Mateus Gamrot, and Neil Magny versus Shafkot Rachmanov. These are actually two very good back-to-back fight night cards. But before we get into that, keep your eye on young Adrian Yanez. I've been high on this kid since he got into the UFC, and Jason, I know you've liked what you've seen of him as well. I absolutely love him. I think he's he's probably one of the more entertaining fighters pound for pound that we're going to see in the UFC for a while. What caught your eye? So he can handle pressure, um, and then he can compute what he just ate, and he'll get hit because he's willing to to take some to give some. But even on the retreat, um, if he does get touched, he resets and reloads and go back on the offensive. And if you try to brawl it, like that's the worst case scenario for you. Because he can punch in between punches as well as I've seen like a non-boxer in the UFC in a long time. Like those are the little things, that kind of vision. And if you try to make it ugly and you start winging fists, he's going to fucking find you. He will find you. And I bet on him, you know, nine times out of ten. If you wanted, if you wanted to make it ugly, you know, he's the he's the prettiest ugly fighter when it goes that direction I've seen in a while. The first thing that caught my eye was as a young fighter making his debut in the UFC, I noticed he didn't rush. A lot of young fighters, they just come out guns blazing, right? And we've seen him several times now, and he takes his time, he gets his reads, which is something you usually see in veteran fighters. It's something they develop with experience, they learn to slow down, they get smarter, whereas this kid came in smart. Yeah, he he is able to tighten things up as it's going on in real time. And it's it's not even like it's so much an adjustment, it's just like he's taking a second to to focus in on his target and it gets a little closer and a little closer and he starts finding shots as the fight goes on and he hits hard. Um, he seems to have a decent chin. He's got great fighting instincts and incredible fighter vision, you know, that boxing vision that, uh, that I refer to quite often. He's got that in spades um, and he's, he's a fearless little bastard, isn't he? Like he's, he's not afraid to get hit. And if you put a couple on him, he may give a little ground, but it's only just so he can reset and put it back on you. It isn't. It isn't a retreat. It is like let me just let me just separate for a second so that we can start again. And when we do, he makes the bet on himself all, every time, and it comes out on top. Believe it or not, Yanez is also a black belt in BJJ, so we haven't even seen that side of him yet. So. There's more to uncover with this kid. There's more upside. Yeah, absolutely. And with the excellent grappling that, w- that we see in the lighter weight classes, it's going to be good to see what his BJJ black belt does because we know what his hands can do. So I'm, I'm really, really interested to see this kid's career unfold. Now let's talk about Cater versus Emmett, which we previewed on the Patreon feed. It was a close fight, which I mentioned I thought it would be. I thought Cater won, but the split decision went Emmett's way, which isn't a robbery. It was close. I would have been okay with a draw. But what's interesting is, lots of things we mentioned panned out, yet Emmett still won. First, it was clear Cater was the better striker and better defensively. Cardio was not an issue for either fighter. It was all about the jab, which I want to ask you later about, Jason. Cater was also much bigger, which posed some challenges. But one thing I did mention that we had to watch out for was that with Cater, Historically, he has a problem with volume. The question was, could Emmett bring that volume? And he did. 
It wasn't always pretty, but he brought it. It also ended up with Emmett showing more variety. He mixed in takedowns and kicks, whereas Cater was mostly headhunting. But to be fair to Cater, it made sense why he headhunted because he was landing nearly every headshot he threw. So something I texted you, Jason, was why can't Emmett avoid those jabs? Because they all seem to land all night. Well, I think it was because he didn't want to get too far out of range. Mm. And even though he was getting, yeah, right. So even though he was getting touched up and bruised up, um, he, he didn't really feel like he could, if he gave too much ground, he couldn't hit those little shift blitzes that he was hitting. And he was doing them on a regular basis and looked pretty good doing them. Even if he wasn't super effective, the punches that he was throwing, they were hard and heavy and you heard them. It was that whipping effect that went past um, that went past Cater's head. And I said it before, like those punches um, in like a violent, chaotic sport, it's tough to tell in real time if they're landing and they're landing effectively. But they I mean, they get your attention, whether you're a fan, you're a judge or a fighter. And I think they got Cater's attention. Um, but, you know, to your point, Cater's jab was effective. But it's not a finishing shot for him, especially someone who can who can eat a punch as well as Emmett. So I think it was a combination of just how good Calvin Cater's jab is and the willingness of Emmett to accept that jab and in accepting it, um, deciding that it was a, a calculated risk to think he could do a bit more based on his power, aggressiveness, and the willingness to to try to win rounds. Uh, with some strategy so he you know if you know what's coming you can sort of you can sort of plan for it and you can make those adjustments based off of it i think the calculus for Emmett was if that's all he had to worry about then he would accept it so almost similar to how some fighters fall in love with the right hand it seemed like the jab was a blessing and a curse where because he was landing it cater wasn't forced to be more versatile. He wasn't forced to show more variety, which ended up being his downfall. That's exactly right. I mean, that's the fight in a nutshell. That's, that speaks volumes too, because uh, Cater can fight you with just a jab and you could be the seventh ranked 145 pounder in the world. And he can, he can arguably beat you on the scorecards. That says something to how effective his jab is, but let's be honest. In a, a sport that wants to be incredibly entertaining and fan friendly, you got to do more than the jab sometimes. And I think it was an incredibly close fight and could have gone either way. Um, I tend to lean towards Cater as well, though I get the gamesmanship of of Emmett and how he fought it and how we know historically judges score things. No one wants to sit back and watch a jab fest. And if uh, if there's a tendency to reward power and aggression then you know that's that's the calculus that that emmett's working with and you know he showed good cardio the ability to keep it up over five rounds but you know the one of the reasons um the, like i said before the jab was landing as often as it was was because um well again those two reasons because cater's excellent at it and the willingness of emmett to accept it now did it surprise you that emmett didn't gas even though he was throwing all power shots? See, it did, but I, I, I don't want to say that he didn't gas because he didn't. He obviously didn't gas. But what did change, and the reason he became so much more hittable in the rounds, rounds three and on, was because his footwork changed. Because he had to reserve some energy. He couldn't have the same kind of energy spend with those big shifts and sliding across center line and coming back big each time. Um, and and, and with that, he was able to reserve a little more. But those rounds got closer the less he did it. And those are the rounds we saw, you know, Cater start to win. And when you take away that footwork, you know, it makes it a, a little bit easier to handle that pressure from Emmett. Do you think that power gave Cater some pause? I really do. And I, I wish that it didn't. But that might be why he was in the fight. You know, who knows? Who knows how things play out? But um, when they did start to exchange, you saw two things. One, Emmett throws and hits incredibly hard. But Cater, Cater is so ever-present in the pocket that he can eat a fucking shot, man. <laughs> Boy, can he. I mean, 
and when he when he decided to mix it up a little bit or like walk through um the 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 danger zone to throw those elbows and he got hit with some stuff on the way in he was still there and you know he didn't get wild he had the ability to, to persevere so i think it's tough because you could easily say that what what he did won him the fight if if one judge wasn't an absolute idiot scoring the fourth round for for Emmett. But you can also say that he was a little bit a little bit too reserved at the same time. One thing you mentioned was you can have a right hand if you set it up well. And Emmett actually has a lot of different setups for that right hand. He also uses stance switches, which you mentioned, to close the distance. And he's actually really tricky with those. The shots he mixes in from those stance switches. Which we have to remember TJ Dillashaw developed that footwork initially from this camp, and so many fighters there were mimicking Dominic Cruz. So what did you think about those stance switches, and do you think it gave Cater any problems? I think it definitely gave him some problems in the first two rounds. It's a little bit hard to jab at a target that is moving um, that aggressively laterally or, or at angles. And the interesting thing was that Cater was still pretty effective with it. Um, but it does when someone is breaking down and crashing that distance and you can't just jab constantly without some defensive responsibility when you have someone that hits as hard as Emmett does and he's so right hand heavy. Um, but the the ability for him to to shift like that because he's a big, strong, powerful. I mean, I don't want to say big because he's five, six or something, <laughs> but he's wide. He's like a tank, right? He's like five, six across. Also, he's that broad. <laughs> uh, so. Like he's he's cutting angles and coming forward pretty aggressively, and he was. I thought he did a better job of punching with both hands, also, which uh, to go back to what you said before about giving uh, giving Cater some pause, it gave him a little more to contend with, and I think that that might have been the difference. Was one fighter was implementing an exceptional use of a singular tool, where other per, where the other fighter was doing a pretty good job with multiple tools. So, I mean, do you, do you score the beauty of the, the proficiency um, and effectiveness of a jab, um, especially if it starts to, to, to carve your, the, your opponent up? Um, or do you, some of the optics of Emmett crashing the distance, punching, uh, punching Cater in the shoulder, and then just shoving him away like he was his little brother, those optics aren't great for uh for calvin cater and like as like a boxing purist i would say well you don't score that shit but at the same time it's it's a fist fight in a cage with little gloves and you don't know regardless of what the the criteria is these judges are not consistent and it's really really tough outside of open scoring to know what, what you're working with so you know i think yeah you got to do a little bit more at times in the, the, the gamesmanship and the ability to try to sneak around, like I said before, is, is, is important. A note to our loyal listeners, if you love the Southpaw Project, please support us and help us get paid for our labor by financially supporting us on Patreon. This will give you access to exclusive bonus content, as well as our private chat group on Discord. Show your Southpaw solidarity by supporting us at patreon.com slash southpawpod. Now, as far as damage, Emmett really wore a lot of that. What did he show you as far as his defense? He wasn't as stiff and rigid as he tends to be because he plants heavy in throws. So with like an increasing reliance on that footwork to break down that distance, which I think was a pretty good plan against the jab, when you're a little more fluid and not so rigid, you can float with shots and you can roll or take enough of the sting off it. And I think he relied a lot on his chin and his counter pressure and counter power as part of his defensive package. So like I said, he was willing to eat those shots, but there's only so many times you can let Calvin Cater jab you in the face before you start looking like a fucking goblin. You know? And he, he did it, and he did it a lot. So, you know, the, 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 it worked out for the judges, but it was an incredibly close fight. It was one that I would have been happier to see a draw uh, with as well. And I think those fights need to be scored a draw, especially if 
fifty percent of someone's purse is on a, a number one. We, we can get into that later <laughs> at another point. But there's fifty percent of a man's income tied to that, and that's also the money he's paying his coaches with. So everyone who's getting a percentage is getting half of that percentage, or like the full percentage, but the percentage is cut in half when you don't get your win bonus. So I think it should be a wash. I think it should be, um, you know, there should be a new rule that if it is a draw in an excellent fight like it was and that close and everyone put it out there on the line and everyone walks away with their purse. I like that. Full purse. Now, Emmett is short, but he fights even shorter than he is and ducks under a lot of punches or gets hit on the top of his head or forehead. So it seems like fighting short is one way that he fights defensively. Oh, yeah, for sure. He ducks that head like an old school tough man. I don't know if you ever saw the <laughs> the one tough man movie with... Uh, you mean Gladiator? With Brian, De- Brian Denny? Yeah, where he would duck down. And, and he said back in the old bare knuckle days, you would just duck down and let the punches hit off the top of the forehead. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, like there's another there's another movie, um, Dennis Quaid and Tough Enough, right? Do you, you remember that movie? He was he was is, there's this big like big stout man in front of him. He was bald headed too, and he would just like duck his head and you put punch him on top of the head, punch him on top of that, and you realize you weren't you weren't hurting this guy. So when you are and to say that he fought short is the truth because Emmett likes punching uphill. So he fought short. He fights in a little bit of a crouch stance, and he bombs over top, and he whips those shots, and he whips them hard. So yeah, there was, and with that, like I said before, he was content on letting some of those jabs land, so that he could be in position, or um, at least break down enough distance that he could he could put together some combinations and hopefully find his target. We know what happens usually when he does. So I think that's an excellent point of fighting short, letting some of those punches hit him on top of the head, trusting and believing in his own physical tools and attributes. Um, and you know, that, at that point, it becomes incumbent on Cater to add some diversity to his attack so that, you know, there's um, – and, and I love Calvin Cater, but he's better when he fights with more than just a jab and a spinning elbow. Uh, he really is. He's He's got good wrestling chops. And – this fight may have came down to whether or not a bullshit takedown attempt really that w- did anything at all, but created enough diversity and something visually substantial enough for the judges to to give Emmett the nod. So decision aside, I actually thought Cater would find a KO before the end because it seemed like he was finding his range and getting his reads. But whenever Cater would land his right, Emmett just ate it and came forward. And you've mentioned this before, for fighters to just win the rounds. And it seemed like Cater got so tunnel visioned about hitting Emmett to the face, looking for that right, he forgot about definitively winning the rounds. Another excellent point, for sure. Like that was one of the big differences. Um, to, to think that your jabs were, and they, they were incredibly effective. And you know how much I love fighting behind a jab and how I wish more fighters would do it. Like he could, he could, do a clinic for elite UFC fighters on how to effectively use a jab. That's how good uh, Calvin Cater's jab is. But there tends to be a little bit more diversity that is necessary, and you can mix some things up. Because if you are winning the round on a jab, but then you are losing the round, and you only win the round on a jab, and someone is continually giving distance and giving ground, how do you get back in that fight if you're just walking forward with a jab? And the guy's not in range. Like, how are you, where's your other pressure? What else are you going to give them to put behind it to get, to keep them guessing, to keep their rhythm a little bit broken and to keep them like mentally and physically off balance. And a, a takedown attempt, even if you just beat them to the hips and then you they pull you up with the wizard and you get in good head position and pressure against the cage and you finish the round with an elbow that you throw that does nothing. Like it hits off the cage or the guy's shoulder or the, like the meaty part of your arm hits him and it doesn't do anything, it looks better. It looks better. And that's like that, those are the things you sort of need to do at the 30 second mark or the 20 second mark or even the, the once the clapper goes, clap, clap, clap. You gotta, you gotta go. You gotta go with something rather than just saying, I think, I think that I did enough. Now let's talk about Sarukian versus Gamrot, which I was surprised they made this a headliner but says a lot about what the UFC thinks about these two. 
Sarukian's only lost once, and that was in his debut fight, and it was against Islam Pakachev, of all people. And he gave Islam a run for his money. Since then, he's just been dominant. Then you have Gamrod, who's also an accomplished wrestler and grappler. He lost his UFC debut by split decision, then finished his next three, including Jeremy Stevens and Carlos Diego Ferreira. Jason, give me your thoughts on both of these guys. I really, really like both these fighters. You know, they're, they're grappling centric fighters who have, who have both seemingly committed to developing some striking fundamentals, as well as an overarching strategy that, that blending those two skill sets. Right? And as they continue, and this is what I really want to preach to young fighters, we're seeing sort of a paradigm shift as they continue to get more time at the highest level. Both fighters become, appear to be becoming more problematic matchups for some of the top lightweights in the UFC. And that's a very talent-rich division, right? You know, and I know they're ranked lower than guys like Gagey and Chandler, uh, but you don't hear Gamrot um, or Armin's name coming out of the mouth of any of the top guys. No way. No no chance. You know, they're, No way. They're both very big concerns, even for excellent grapplers in the division. And I'm certain the UFC will keep guys like Patty Pimblett way the fuck away from the two aforementioned fighters. You just explained it. This is why they're fighting each other so early when they're both prospects is probably because nobody else wanted to fight them. It, that's it. Like, There's no one. They're not well known enough. But if you know about fighting, you know who they are. And if if Islam Makachev didn't exist, or maybe even if just his foot sweep didn't exist, Armin's maybe undefeated. You know? So it would take a hell of a PR effort to get the Pimblet hype train back on track if that matchup ever <laughs> took place anywhere in the near future. Now, even though both are wrestlers who can strike, they have different styles and different builds. Sarukian is a shorter but wider fighter who is much more physical. He comes right at you and understands getting hit and having to hit back is just part of getting the wrestling exchange he wants. Gamrot, on the other hand, is the much longer fighter, but also the more evasive fighter. He'll spend more time circling the outside, switching directions and stances. And when I say evasive, you even see it in his wrestling, where he shoots from much further out, or dives, or low ankle picks, which is why his wrestling isn't as successful as Sarukian's. But it's in this in and out and having his opponents chase him where Gamrot finds his finishes. And on the ground, whereas Sarukian is just thinking about ground and pound, Gamrot will mix in submissions, even putting himself on his back for a leg lock. So how do you think these styles clash and what does each need to do to dominate the other? Yeah, I love talking about this, this matchup for sure. Um, but let's, let's start with Gamrot. Like you said, he mixes things up well and has fairly educated defense for such a grappling-centric fighter. Now he, his movement is in and out, like you said, he moves well laterally, um, and and he's loose in there. You know, he's really pretty fluid when you watch him, you know, which I think allows for him to transition from wrestling threat to striking threat. You know, in the, the Scott Holtzman fight, Gamera showed what I feel was a really high fight IQ. You know, with the ability to use movement to set up traps. And feints to keep Holtzman, he's a big, strong pass himself, off balance and out of rhythm. And he used, you know, no one wants to fight someone as strong as Scott Holtzman and fight his hips all day. So he used that low single to avoid that and get got easier finishes. So Gamrot showed a pretty solid chin, even if, if Holtzman really hasn't shown much of a KO threat at the highest level. You know, he can still crack pretty good. So you see a little more, you may see more of a complete package with Gamrot, uh, but what what Armin does, Armin does incredibly well, right? He is such a good wrestler. How good is his wrestling offensive and, and defensively? You know, it, we might be talking about him as one of the best in the UFC if it weren't for, for Islam. You know, and dominant wrestling performance he put on against Frivola, who is a solid wrestler in his own right. So, and I'll say it again, uh, seeing excellent wrestler grapplers who are becoming much more skilled and more proficient in the striking department, so they're able to carry that ridiculous grappling cardio because they're no longer a fish out of water in the striking world, uh, with, with greater comfort comes greater composure. And with that greater composure becomes a decrease in anxiety um, in like 
twitchy reaction and greater energy efficiency. And unless they're matched up with mirror images of themselves, you're going to see them have cardio for days. So you know, that's one of the reasons I really like this, this matchup, because I think um, you're looking at the, the diversity of, of Gamrot's style versus the, the immensely physically, physically gifted wrestler that, uh, that Sarukian uh, is. If you love the Southpaw Project, please support us and help us get paid for our labor by financially supporting us on Patreon. It'll help us supplement the cost of running this project, the incredible time and energy we put into it seven days a week. And you'll be giving us some breathing room, not only to juggle Southpaw with our day jobs, but also to expand Southpaw into other areas. Show your Southpaw solidarity by supporting us at patreon.com slash southpawpod. Who has impressed you more? Well, so that's that's a really good question because I'm really impressed with with Gamrot's fighting style and decision making, especially for someone who's who's a grappler. I think that is where fighting is headed. We're seeing this this how can you modify and tweak these these wrestling centric folks and add the um, and add those striking tools, you know. But the the physical tools in wrestling of Armin have really blown my hair back as well. You know, he's got some really, really impressive stuff. Um, his, his ability to recover from bad situations and bad positions, like we saw in the Islam fight, I think is going to be the difference here. So as much as I love Gamrot, I think the, I'm a little more impressed with the, um, just the physical tools of, of Armin Sarukian. So Gamrot is actually the underdog. So that doesn't surprise you then? No, not really. My biggest concern for Gamrot would be uh, the wrestling and disciplined fundamentals of Armin Sarukian. If he, if he made more mistakes, um, even, even in fights where Frivola has lost or looked um, or hasn't looked great, he's almost always gotten some sort of submission threat off. Like he wasn't even close against Armin. And I wasn't, no one was concerned about Islam submitting on either. So if you take the submission worry off the table, how else do we see Gamrot winning? So that, that's why, like from a, from a betting perspective, that's why I would, that's why I would have to say I'm not all that surprised with, uh, with Gamrot being the dog. Now, speaking of odds, we have Neil Magny as a big underdog against Rachmanov. In another fight for hardcores, do you think those odds are fair, Jason? <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, if you asked me that before I I watched the, the Rachmanov footage again and then again, um, I, I probably would have said, ah, I, I think you got to give Neil Magny his due. But his fight against Max Griffin, um, maybe that's some re- recency bias on me. I'm not. I'm not even sure Neil Magny won that fight in my mind. So, and facts are facts, and Rachmaninoff is a goddamn problem. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt. And I spoke of decision making as a trait for fighters, and I value that in fighters. And I think good fighters um, who aren't physically great fighters can be great fighters based on the ability to make decisions in real time under duress. And Rach- Rachmaninoff's decision making, especially when he has you hurt or when he has you figured out, is exceptional. And I don't have I don't have a, a word that's better than exceptional in my vocabulary at this point. I don't think I've used on every show over and over. But uh, <laughs> uh, that word doesn't do it justice because whether it's whether it's knees, stiff punches, stiff straight punches, spinning techniques, or even submissions, the man can he's per, as perfect as his winning and finishing percentage. And you don't get any better than 100. percent Yeah. So, oh, well, that's why. Uh, that's why he's a big fucking problem. Now, Magny's a veteran, so we're familiar with him. Rachmanov is fairly new to the UFC, but Rachmanov has had 15 fights, 15 wins, and 15 finishes. We've talked about Yuri Prohaska's finishing rate, but this is even more impressive. But Magny's fought dangerous finishers like this before, got them tired, then has taken over the fight. 
What do you think makes Rachmaninoff different from other fighters besides some of the things that you've already mentioned? I wish we had a greater body of work. You know, he's putting people out so goddamn quickly or making, <laughs> making them look so, so pedestrian that I mean, what, what can you say? Um, I really wish we had more information and more data for me to pull from. Not only is there not a lot of footage, but the footage you have, he's not doing much. He's just like watching, watching, right? It's low volume, and then he finishes it. So even within that time, he doesn't show you much. It's just like a short fight, and he does one or two things like an assassin, and then that's it. Which is just, he's, that's it, right? So he, his, his hand position isn't perfect. He, he's moving them a little bit slowly. And when I first watched him, maybe when I watched these fights again, like he doesn't look overly quick to me. And then he throws like a one, two, one, two. And like his shoulders completely reset in perfect position. And they're so fast and so precise and so fucking stiff. I'm like, what was I thinking 15 seconds ago? Like I, w I was looking at his hand position saying, ah, you know, this guy's got some holes. And no, he's just relaxed until he decides to explode. And that, that, that is a fighting style that you, you see with some, some Eastern European boxers. And, and he's got that. He's also not like super chiseled, but he's really, he seems really strong. He seems to throw people around or, or reverse position. You know, he has, he has that shit where you're like, you look at him and you second guess, and then you just watch what he does physically. And then you're like, oh. And then if you don't know anything about fighting, you're watching some of these guys thinking, well, maybe Cowboy Oliveira isn't that good. But he's pretty fucking good, man. <laughs> but I, I think Rockwell's got the goods. I think he's strong. Um, I think he's, he's a striking risk. And uh, he sure is fucking entertaining, too. And Magny is extremely hittable. He's real hittable. And he, especially anyone who wants to put that many offensive punches together it is going to be hittable and he does that like walking in one two one two which he can do because he is so long but the you talk about stiff punching then stiff punching with speed and then stiff punching in combination i see a lot of guys that are fluid and loose like that one that one one and a half long two that mcgregor will throw like he'll stiffen up the final like extension on that shot, but the first two are like just throwaways. Rachmanov is hitting you with throwaway shots that are snapping your head back and rocking you. And then that stiff finish shot, those punches, those initial shots are, are supposed to be range finders, but they're fucking the people up in front of him and he's finding those third and fourth shots. And like, when you get hit by someone who, who is that powerful of a puncher, um, and that physically strong and has uh, that much of a, a diverse finishing possibility that much. And is that dangerous? Like shit, man, like, you gotta, you gotta fight him perfect. And I don't think Magni fights perfect. I think Magni fights long. He fights with volume and he fights to, to make you tired. Now he's mostly known for his cardio. We talked about his hit ability, but what are some good things about Magni striking? What are some things that sometimes catches his opponents by surprise? When you think that he's going to pause, he doesn't pause. You know, I, I always talked about the gentleman's agreement that you see in boxing. You go, ba, 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 I go, ba, ba, ba. Even, even good guys, um, even guys at the highest level. When you score with your stuff, he's quick to, to put it right back on you. And when he scores and you give ground and you think that he's going to take like that that gentleman's agreement to reset, take a deep breath, regroup. He doesn't. Like he put put his back on you again, and that's got to surprise some people. It's really, really tough to catch your rhythm. Um, you know, it's really, really tough to settle and regroup when someone's in your shit the whole time. And that's what Magni does very well. But Magni also likes to force the clinch. Do you think that's a good idea for him in this fight, or should Magni avoid the clinch at all costs? It's tough. I mean, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Want to want to stick at range and like try to jab him, and knowing how hittable Magni tends to be, I think putting him putting Rachmanov against the cage, trying to wear him out. So being a three round fight, I don't know if his cardio advantage will make that much of a difference, especially since Rachmanov tends to pace himself anyway. Yes, he does. Yeah, so I think that's probably your best bet is to try to put him against the cage and win like the 
what do they call it? A wall and stall. I used to call it stolen, <laughs> stolen brawl or wall and brawl, but they just stopped brawling. <laughs> no one, no one had any short offense in the in or excuse me, in the UFC for about a year and a half, other than Felder. So you know, if Magny's not doing work against the cage, throwing elbows, continuing to fight dirty for head position, hand fighting, throwing knees, and Magny does that stuff well. If he does it, he might be able to. He might be able to sneak, uh, sneak around, and in a three round fight. The rest is whether or not someone makes or fights mistake free, or if if you're in a, a three round fight and you can bank one round, you know you can fight you can fight both with some confidence and you can also fight conservatively, depending on you know on how certain things unfold. And you don't have to win the whole round; you just have to win an aspect of that round or a moment of that round decisively. If all other things are pretty even, so I, I think it would be in Magny's best interest to try to slow down the offensive onslaught of Rachmanov and bank that first round. Yeah, because it is a three-round fight, especially, there is a scenario in how Magny can win this fight, which is he just does more, Rachmanov waits too long, and then Rachmanov doesn't fight enough opportunities to win the round, going back to the cater fight. And so he doesn't win the rounds definitively Magni does more and then gets the decision. Yeah, that's a legitimate possibility because uh, we I spoke uh, that Rachmanov seems very strong, but Magni also seems very strong. He's one of those lanky, strong bastards who like they just keep grabbing you. And with with that body type, he can be stronger longer. And you know, I don't know what um, like who's who's the more physically um, strong of the two, but if if there is a strength advantage, or at least if you can nullify Rachmanov's strength advantage and control position and steal that first round with the volume that Magni has, if he has a second round, even if he gets a little sloppy but stays on his feet and is able to put to get put out some volume, maybe he goes into the third round up two rounds to none. And especially if he can no sell some of those hits, right? That could go a long way. Yeah. So. Uh, I get a little bit worried about Magny's durability at this point, though it's been great and it's held up. Um, Max Griffin touched him and hurt him a couple times. And I don't take anything away from Max because I, I really enjoy him as a fighter, but I don't I don't think he has the same finishing ability or the, that opposes the same danger that Rachmanov does. So if the same version of Magny comes out for this fight, I don't I don't think it would go well. But if if there is a differing strategy and you know maybe he just got a little bit complacent thinking max wouldn't be as 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 durable and aggressive as he was and it's a, it, it's it's some pretty good matchmaking from the UFC again because it's something that when i when i watch both those fighters past fights it's something that makes you go i could see it you know i know who i i would rank as the underdog and who I would rank as the favorite. Well, we've already touched on that. But you still wouldn't count Magny out because he, he's durable, he's got ridiculous conditioning, and he's got a, a ton of volume. He's also so long that sometimes longer fighters, because uh, Rachmanov has got some length too, sometimes longer fighters, uh, if you can nullify their length, they get a little bit lost. We saw it in Gustafsson versus John Jones. So if you can do that, sometimes that can throw them off. So be interesting to see how it plays out. All right. That's it for this episode. If you like what we do, sign up for the Patreon. We also have the Liberation Martial Arts Program if you want to train with us from wherever you are. You can also find that on our Patreon. You can find Southpaw merch at our store. You can find all the pertinent links on the show notes. With all that said, thanks for listening. Always a pleasure.